Good morning, community. Thank you for joining us today on this Thanksgiving weekend, both here in the auditorium. Thanks for joining us online today. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn right in the middle, Psalm 51. We're going to jump into Psalm 51 today. So you turn in there, I got a story for you about traveling. I don't know if anybody is traveling. Maybe you're watching online because you're in the middle of traveling, but I had two friends last month go on an, a road trip, multi-state. They were on interstate, countless hundreds and hundreds of miles of interstate before them. So what, before they left, and they'd been on this trip before, my one friend says, hey, I'll drive if you navigate. And so the other friend agreed, and, and so they go off. They take off on this journey across states, miles and miles of interstate. And early on, they get into a discussion about a television show. And turns out neither one of them had seen the show. They heard about it. So the driver starts asking questions to the navigator. And so the navigator does what probably any of us at this point, grab a smartphone, they get it out and they start, they look up the show. Wow, it's eight seasons and there's like 15 episodes per season. And this one's about this and this. And, and the driver's asking questions and the navigator's going back and like, well, it says they did this and they found this and then this is possible. And so all the hours and hours and hours of conversation about this television show until, Navigator, they're researching, researching, until they start slowing down and they come to a stop and their, their halt led my Navigator friend to look up from his phone to wonder, why are we stopping on interstate, right? And he sees a stoplight. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with interstate travel, but it's not a lot of stoplights on an interstate. And so my navigator friend turned to my driver friend and goes, <clears throat> um, where are we? To which my driver friend answers, you're the navigator. I don't know if anybody's been there. Anybody don't have to raise your hands because maybe you're guilty, but you've been on a trip and you're in charge of directions and all of a sudden you don't know where you're at. That's never a good thing, right? You don't want your navigator to be asking the question, where are we? So he followed up after he got out the GPS, where are we? finds out there's 70 miles the wrong way. They spent over an hour driving. He got off on some weird interchange, drove 70 miles over an hour the wrong way. Still talking about TV show, TV show, TV show. And so he then asked his driver friend, well, how did we get here? Right, which we know. The driver's like, well, we've been talking about the stupid TV show. Like, you're supposed to be paying attention to directions. Let me know. But they got 70 miles derailed. Had to turn around two plus hours behind now because they were looking at something that ended up being a distraction. Led them to the question, how did we get here? Maybe you can relate. Maybe you've been on a trip and you're like, how did I get here? Right? I don't remember. How did I get here? Which is okay because you can figure out your way on a trip. But have you ever asked that question about life? Like once life kind of starts happening and thing and you and difficulty and struggle and you end up just hitting the pause button going, how did I get here? Now, sometimes we end up in the middle of difficulty and struggle just because like life, right? Through nobody's fault, we just end up in a difficult situation. We got to deal with difficult circumstances. And if you missed last week's message, Pastor Scott had some great stuff from Scripture on how to persevere and navigate difficult circumstances. Sometimes we just wake up and we're in the middle of it, and we need to know how to persevere. But sometimes, more often than most of us would probably like to admit, we end up in difficult situations because of the choices that we make. We choose poorly, we focus on the wrong things, we listen to the wrong people, and we end up going down path little by little by little until, how did I get here? See, sin kind of works that way. When you find yourself making the wrong choice we're all tempted by sin, and sin, little by little by little, will start to work in our lives until we end up 
far from God, wondering how did I get here? Paul kind of describes this with a little bit of a history lesson in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Hold on, Psalm 51, stay there. All right, we'll get there, I promise. But in 1 Corinthians Chapter 10, Paul gives us this glimpse. He gives us a history lesson on Israel and how they toyed around with sin, little by little, and where it led. Sin always destroys. Look at this. Uh, Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. Sin always destroys. Paul goes on, we should not test Christ, as some of them did. They were killed by snakes. Sin always destroys. Paul continues, do not grumble, as some of them did. They were killed by the destroying angel. You see, Israel has a history of toying around with sin, and sin always leads to destruction. Sin always destroys, and Paul knows the danger of this. And it happens little by little. It's a sneaky road. It's a sneaky path. It kind of works like this. We're tempted by sin. But here, we start on this journey by thinking about it. Everybody say, think about it. Right? The first thing we do when it comes to sin, we think about it. Israel, they were just delivered from generations of slavery through maybe the greatest series of miracles ever in the history of our planet outside of the cross. Like God delivers them from Egypt through the Red Sea into the promised land. There they are. They have a king. But hey, what are those other nations doing? They have actual human kings, right? Don't they? They're thinking about it. So first you think about it, but then you rationalize it. Everybody say rationalize it. That's how sin works. First you think about it, but then then Israel's like, what would it be like if we had an earthly king? You know, in order to do that, maybe we should start some trade negotiation. Maybe maybe we should start talking to them, considering how they do their life and and implementing some of those things in us so that we can, they're thinking about it, now they're rationalizing it. And then Paul points out, they do it. Everybody say, do it. They just, they just sin. They find themselves in the middle of sin. Why? Because they thought about it. Then they rationalize it. They surround themselves with the wrong people. And then they're in the middle of sin. They're doing it. But then, then they defend it. That's the point. Everybody say, defend it. We end up there on this little by little by little, this path of sin. Then we're defending it. God, I know you said you're in church. And I know we have a king. And I know we're not supposed to intermarry. But... It's not that bad. I'm kind of in control. God, we still love you, sort of, right? No. I can promise you, if you're anywhere along that path of sin, stop. You find yourself saying, Tim, it's okay. I've got this under control. I can deal with this. No, you can't. No, you can't. In fact, Paul knows this, and he, he... he instructs us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful so you don't fall. Be careful so you don't fall. You find yourself playing around with sin, indulging in temptation, and saying things like, I'm okay, I'm all right. You're not. Sin will lead you down a path of destruction. It did for the Israelites. And it did for King David, who wrote Psalm 51. You can read about his demise in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 11. Hang on Psalm 51. We're coming. All right. But in 2 Samuel 11, you can read about how sin destroyed David, how this path of sin involving a a woman named Bathsheba. You've maybe heard this story. David's on the roof. He looks down. He sees a pretty woman taking a bath. And we know, if you know how the story ends, just right there, time out, walk away, no. But he turns, hey, who is that? He's thinking about it. The messengers say, "Mm, no, that's a married woman, her husband, Uriah. He's thinking about it. But then, hey, go get her, bring her. Now he's rationalizing it. 
Hey, we're just gonna, we're just gonna hang out. We're gonna have some brunch. We're gonna have some good conversation. We're gonna get to know each other a little bit. Her husband's off to war. Like, like I can be an encourager and a support. Then he commits adultery, sends her away, did it, thought about it, rationalized it, did it. Then she says, hey, I'm pregnant. Uh-oh. So he says, I know. And he starts to defend it, starts to cover up this big elaborate plan. Bring her husband home. He's a man of honor. He won't while everybody else is away at war. David's like, oh, okay, well, why don't you go back to war? I'll create a plan where you're dead and I'm respond- like, I'm gonna kill you. Then I'll marry her. Then she'll be my wife. Then everything will be okay because nobody has to know about all this ugly, dirty. He thought about it. He rationalized it. He did it, now he's defending it, and he he thinks he's in control. The problem, he's not. He doesn't think it matters. It does. God sends a prophet, Nathan, to confront him man to man, face to face, and he says, David, you are that man. You are guilty before God. And that's where we find David right here as he writes the words to Psalm 51. Broken, empty, So are you with me? Psalm 51. I want us to see today in this psalm how David acts. I want us to pull three things out of Psalm 51 that can inspire and encourage us if we find ourselves on this path of sin. Three things that we can do. We can follow David's example to get back right with God. The first thing we see David pray for in Psalm 51 is God, cleanse me. God, cleanse me. Write that down somewhere. He starts there, and there's a reason he starts with God, cleanse me. Look at these first verses of Psalm 51 with me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your gener- your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Walk away. Wash away, sorry, all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. You are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me. There it is again with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. David, here, he goes down a path of sin, and how he reacts is huge. He ended up doing things he never thought he would do. He didn't want to do in places he shouldn't have been. How did I get here? And David's response is this. Repent. I imagine him on his hands, on his knees, maybe face down before God, begging him as he repents. And repentance is this. It's used all throughout scripture. It's not an I'm sorry. Repentance means change. Like there's a change in my thinking. There's a change in my direction. I'm leaving this and I'm changing where I'm going. It's way more than just feeling sorry for having done something wrong. David repents before God. God, cleanse me. And here's what that looks like. Right off the bat, he asks God in verse one to have mercy on him. Mercy is this. Mercy is not giving someone what they actually deserve. David, guilty of murder, guilty of adultery, guilty of lying, several other things on this list. You have to start with mercy because he deserves death. That's what he deserves. There's no question about it. And David knows the depth and the hurt of his guilt. Every ounce of his body, his entire life is messed up by these choices, by this sin. He's angered God. Like, God, have mercy on me. Please don't give me what I deserve. And then we see David beg, if that's your will, Lord, if you let me live, God, wash me. He uses that phrase And it's a beautiful phrase that means to to rid yourself of any filth 
Any garment that's dirty or muddy or stained, remove everything from me that has any hint of dirt and then clothe me, God, in brand new linens. So have mercy. God, wash me and then cleanse me. Cleanse me with hyssop, he says. Hyssop is this, this small bush this shrub that priests would use to dip in water and sometimes blood and to sprinkle it in the temple and the tabernacle, to sprinkle it on the people as they brought their sin offerings before God. And when the priests would sprinkle these people, they would be washed ceremoniously, washed clean of their sin as they offered their sacrifices. And here we see God, God being begged by David. God, cleanse me so that I can be in your presence. God, cleanse me. Empty me of anything that is evil, sinful, or wrong. What a beautiful picture of repentance. I was having a discussion with my teenage son, Jude, about, about sin and like how sin messes you up and how do we get rid of sin, what repentance looks like and I was asking him, like, how do you stop doing some of the same things, right? Temptations out there. What, what do we do? What's that look like in our lives today? And he goes, well, dad, what, a, what about this? What if you, you have a glass and it's half full of oil and half full of water because oil and water don't mix? I'm like, yeah, go on. That's pretty good. He goes, what if the oil is God, right? And the water is evil and temptation. And, and when you repent, like you dump out the water and the oil still there. I'm like, that's not bad. That's a pretty good start. But how do you keep not doing it? He goes, but here's, doesn't God talk about like there's storms? They, they don't just go away, right? Life is filled with storm after storm after like God. I was like, actually in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about having a firm foundation because when the storms come and in, in John, the gospel of John, Jesus says this in this world, he just tells us you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. I was like, Jude, you're right on because you, you get rid of the bad, but it, it's still going to storm. And he goes, so, so here's the thing. Like, if you just leave it empty, the storm's going to come. It's just going to fill back up with water again. I was like, yeah. He goes, so what if when you dump the water out, that's only the first step getting rid of the bad. What if then the second part is you have to fill up the rest of the cup with the oil? That's pretty good. I was like, I don't know about you, but I was like, hey, I think we all just got a lesson from a teenager right there. Like, not only do we have, like repentance isn't just don't do the bad. Repentance is God, fill me up. We're filled with God. And we see this in Psalm 51. David prays, God, cleanse me. That's the first thing. But we then see the second thing he prays for, God, restore me. Don't just get rid of the bad. Because the storm's going to come and you're going to undergo, you'll just fill back up again. You have to be restored by God. Look at what David says in Psalm 51, starting in verse 8. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let, let the bones you have crushed, let them rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. And here it is. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. I love verse 10. It's kind of the, the centerpiece of this entire chapter. Because David, he says, create it in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David knows that his heart is the problem. His heart is the issue. And unless he deals with that, unless that's restored and filled up with God, he's wasting his time, right? Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19. He says, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Quick pause. Think about David. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Comes from the heart. Comes from the heart. 
So David says, create in me a pure heart, O God. I love that he says, O God, because he doesn't say, create in me a pure heart, O family, O kids, O wife, O husband, O job, O hobbies, O food, O material possessions. No, David says, O God, you have to be the one that I fill up with. Because all these other things don't last. They will leave me empty. And then when temptation comes, I'm not prepared. Create in me a pure heart, O God. I love that David, after he's cleansed by God, he says, God, I have to fill up with you. You alone are the source of salvation. You alone are the source of joy. Look at Psalm 51, 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Restore. Now, car, car people, listen, you know this. David's not talking about a, a $200 paint job to make everything look good right before you sell your vehicle. He's talking about a total frame off restoration. You know what I'm talking about, car folks. We're talking a frame off restoration means you take the entire body of a vehicle off and you start from the ground up. Every nut, every bolt, every wire is looked over and made new, brand new, piece by piece by piece, so that when the product is finished, you have a brand new vehicle. David prays that kind of prayer. That's the restoration he's looking for because he knows the danger of sin. Sin has invaded every part of his body. He says in verse 3, my eyes. Verse 6, he talks about his mind. Verse 8, he says his ears and his bones. Verse 10, his heart and his spirit. Verse 14, says his hands. Verses 13 through 15, he talks about his lips. Sin has devastated every area of his life. And he says, God, I need a total frame off restoration. Everything made new. Because we tend to fill up with a lot of things instead of God. And here we see David begging God, cleanse me and restore me. And then, then David prays this prayer, starting in verse 13, use me. You cleanse me, God. You restore me, God. And then, use me. Look at verses 13 and following. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Then, notice that, I'll pause real quick. You can leave the scripture there. But only after we're cleansed by God, only after we're restored by God, then I will teach transgressors your ways. Then, David says, use me. I love the order of that. He continues on, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord. My mouth will declare your praise. You don't delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite. Here it is, heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous and burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Then. You see, God wants to use you. Somebody needs to hear that today. In the midst of the temptation, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the difficulty, in the midst of the, the times we walk away. Listen, God wants to use you. He desires to use you. Then, see, there's an order. When you're cleansed by God and restored by God, then David says, use me. He wants to use you right where you're at. He's got you in a house, in a neighborhood, in a job. Right now, God wants to use you, but will you consider the advice of David? God, cleanse me. God, restore me, because then it's about God. See, this isn't about David's ability anymore. 
It's about David's availability. After God cleanses him, after God restores him, it's not about him anymore. So whatever he does is now by God's strength and God's design. It's about his will and his kingdom. And David says, use me. Because it's not about him. It's about God. So I ask you this morning, will you let God cleanse you? Will you let God restore you? Because if you do, God will use you. He wants to use you as ambassadors, as witnesses, to spread the word of his son, Jesus Christ, to tell people about his kingdom, to tell people about the gospel. He wants to start with you. Will you pick up God's word? Will you accept him as Lord and Savior of your life? Be buried in the waters of baptism, rise and walk in a brand new life, cleansed and restored so that he can use you then in your family. Today, right now, husbands, you love your wives in a way that brings honor and glory to God. Wives, you love your husbands in a way that brings honor and glory to God. It's not about you anymore. Parents, you show your kids who Jesus is and you raise them in a way that brings honor and glory to God. It's not about your family. It's about shining God's kingdom and his glory. Will you work in a way that brings honor and glory to God? Will you be used by God after you're cleansed, after you're restored? God says, I will use you. David's example here. He says, I will will help people turn from their transgressions. He wants to help people walk towards God. He says, my lips will sing your praises. I will glorify you. God wants to use you in your neighborhoods in your homes, in your jobs, here in South Florida, wherever you're at, wherever you're watching from, God wants to use you, but you have to start with God being number one in your life. You know an interesting thing about David? Then in the Bible, near the end, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, there's this hall of fame of faith. List person after person after person, all these people who stayed faithful to God and God used them to glorify his kingdom and his will. Moses and Abraham and all these guys, David's name shows up after Bathsheba, after murder, after adultery, after lying, David's name is there. How in the world does that happen? Well, you know, before Bathsheba, before he's even king, the prophet Samuel, in response to an ungodly king, says, I will seek out a man after God's own heart. He's talking about David. As in spite of David's mistakes, he humbled himself. He repented of his sin. And then God was still able to use him. Humility, repentance. We're challenged with that same thought in Psalm chapter 51, verse 17. David says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise. It's his heart. It's his heart. It's humility. Later on in the New Testament, the book of James, chapter 4, verse 10, we're encouraged with this Humble yourselves before the Lord. He will lift you you up. So are you here today and you're imperfect? I've got some good news. Are you watching today? Are you listening and, and you're broken inside? I've got some good news. Are you empty? Are you hurting? Are you struggling right now? I've got some good news. His name His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He paid the penalty for any sin that you've ever done on the cross, and he rose again, victorious over death, victorious over sin, and he invites all of us to follow him. He will cleanse you. He will restore you. He will use you. Will you follow him? today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, right here and right now, I pray 
for the condition of our hearts. We know, we know what happens when we listen to our hearts. But God, I pray for some courage to come before you and be honest, to be humble, to repent of anything that's keeping us from you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, the invitation to a new life, an eternal life, by following him. God, cleanse us, restore us, and use us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.